and good morning wherever you are watching us from behalf of the nepal institute for international cooperation and engagement and the water policy center it gives me a great pleasure to extend a warm welcome to our distinguished speakers chair and participants who registered for the event this is the se second session of the conference to chair and moderate the session it's a real pleasure to have professor swaran singh here with us so Professor Swaran Singh, Chairperson, Center for International Politics, Organization and Disarmament, School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, India. Dr. Swaran Singh is Professor and Chair for Diplomacy and Disarmament at Center for International Politics, Organization and Disarmament, School of International Studies. Professor Singh was formerly visiting professor at Australian National University, Science PO. University of Peace, Pudanand Ziamen Universities, Shanghai Uni uh, Institute of International Studies and Center of Asian Studies in China. Asian Center at the University of the Philippines and Cho Hiroshima, Hiroshima Koto University and also guest faculty at Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. He was academic consultant at Center de Science, Humanis, and a research fellow at Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis. Without any further ado, let me now request Professor Swaran Singh to moderate the session. Thank you. I hope all of you are able to <coughs> hear me. <coughs> yes, sir, loud and clear. I'm happy we are starting on time. We are just uh, five minutes into our session, we have 120 minutes, uh, which means now roughly 115 minutes. Uh, what I would love to do is to make sure that we have adequate discussion and participation from the floor. So let me set a few ground rules uh, for all of us. Uh, one, that uh, I will also be the timekeeper for all of you. Given the fact that we have about, let's say, 100 minutes and we have four speakers, uh, we could give you somewhere between 15, ideally, to maximum 20 minutes each for my four speakers. And then I will alert you at 15 minutes, uh, if you have not concluded on 15 minutes, so that you can then take one or two or three or maximum five more minutes uh, to make it full 20 minutes. So that's rule number one. Uh, let's all try to uh, speak for four speakers within 20 minutes so that then we can uh, leave enough time for discussion on the floor. The second uh, ground rule which I want to uh, request is uh, both the host uh, who just introduced me and all the four speakers I would like them to have their videos on so that I see them all the time on my screen as if we are actually sitting together. And indeed, I will encourage all other participants. I see we have now 19 people with us. Uh, I'll indeed encourage all of you to switch on your videos so that we do not behave like we are listening to radio. Um, but we should be feeling that we are in the same room and that encourages the speaker to make a good presentation if he or she is able to see speaking to actual audience. So I'm requesting all of you uh, to please, if you can, switch on your videos uh, so that the speakers have the sense of speaking to uh, real people rather than uh, empty uh, screen, uh, you know, or just empty boxes of screen. You already have uh, the introductions uh, of your four speakers with you, given uh, by the hosts. So I won't even spend much time uh, at initial stages, if we have spare time in the end, then I will maybe say a few things myself. But my priority will be to the participants uh, so that they, all of them, have some say in, in discussion today and have a takeaway from today's discussion. So we'll try to make sure that participants have a chance to either make comments or ask questions. So let me right away go to the first speaker of uh, the day. I think he's already with us. Uh, Dr. C. Lalrang Siami is the first speaker. He's going to speak on South China Sea post pandemic order. Or over to uh, Dr. Lal Sen Siami. Please, your 20 minutes begin now, ideally 15. 
Thank you, sir. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Actually, uh, I have not yet got my PhD degree and I am still doing my PhD. <laughs> That's what I want to clarify first. And good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor Swaran Singh, our host and the organizers of this conference. And before I start, I would like to share my screen. Yes, please. Mm. The host will have to allow you to share screen. Rushton, please, sir. She's actually already the co-host, so she okay. can actually, yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. All the speakers are already okay. the co host Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Please. Please. Okay. Uh, today I will be speaking on the topic of the South China Sea uh, post-pandemic order. And before I actually proceed, I would like to uh, have a few flashback or very quick flashback of the nature of the disputes in the South China Sea. As we know that the South China Sea is a major focus of tensions to the international community in the 21st century. And we know that the South China Sea and its enclosed features have immense geopolitical, economic, and strategic significances. It is a rich resource sea and serves as a vital link between uh, Pacific and uh, Asian country, and it is an international commercial shipping route. It is estimated that approximately US dollar 4 trillion trade passes through the South China Sea annually, and due to so many reasons, it is contested by six parties, China, Malaysia, Philippines, Vietnam, Brunei, and Taiwan. Maritime disputes in the South China Sea predominantly centered around the questions of sovereignty over the sea and several features and the rights of using them. Claimant states draw their respective territorial lines to designate their claims. As a result, several intersecting lines were drawn uh, in the South China Sea. The United Nations Conventions on the Laws of the Sea in 1982 clearly prescribed the zone that a sovereign state can have exercise rights over it, which is called the Exclusive Economic Zone, to which countries have nautical, 200 nautical miles from their baseline. All the parties in the South China Sea are the signatories of this UNCLOS, and if these parties act according to the UNCLOS problem will be solved. But what complicated the matter is that China, being the most powerful claimant, claims majority of the sea uh, in the name of historical rights claimed by itself through its nine dash line, which is contradict with most of the other literal claims. Therefore, majority of the conflicts arises between China on the one side and other claimants on the other. And let us look at the recent developments in the South China Sea. Recent developments in the South China Sea indicates that post-2009 has been marked by rising tensions, several incidences over rival claimants. Uh, Malaysia and Vietnam had a joint submission to the Commission on the Laws of the Continental Shelf in 2009, but later the two countries have reached a broad understanding between each other. And another notable development is the Scarborough Shoal standoff between China and Philippines in 2013. China took a control of a reef about 140 nautical <laughs> miles from the Philippines coast and Philippines accused China of violating international law by interfering with its sovereignty and filed a complaint to the Permanent Court of Arbitration in 2013. The PCA rulings in June 2016 breaks the ice of the South China Sea dispute when it declared that majority of the South China Sea uh, claims by the Chinese does not have a legal basis and remain inconsistent with the United Nations Conventions on the Laws of the Sea. The gov Chinese government statement on the PCA ruling showed that it will never withdraw its claims due to international uh, tribunal rulings. And since 2014, China has substantially expanded its ability to monitor the end project power uh, throughout the South China Sea via the construction of artificial islands, which 
Other countries accuse China of using it as uh, for civilian mi military bases at the disputed Spratly and Parcel Islands. Uh, this include radar and communication arrays, airstrips, and several forms of anti-ship cruise missile systems. Therefore, several external nations of the world, including India, China, uh, India, Japan, USA, Australia, etc., rebuked China for its non-compliance with the international law. Since then, the South China Sea dispute became another hot battle of global tensions. And in a direct point of conflict in the South China Sea, external powers not only show their concern for freedom of navigation and overflight in the South China Sea, but time and again, top government officials of the world often proclaims that they hope all parties in the disputed South China Sea be abide by the 2002 Declaration of the Conduct of parties and the universal principle of UNCLOS, and that disputes be resolved peacefully. However, situations became looming in the current time. And let us see the South China Sea situation in the COVID world. As the world is facing pandemic, the nature of the South China Sea disputes also remain intensifying. The year 2020 decisively proves that the South China Sea does conflict does not remain confined only to the claimant parties. Firstly, South China Sea marks a high alert on China's proactive action when countries of the world were fighting coronavirus and nations of the world economy is suffering. China deploys aircraft carrier and shows what strong men do best in the South China Sea. And US defense officials said that China has launched a series of ballistic missiles uh, this week. The United States, on the other hand, can be witness its forceful approach during the pandemic when it sends its aircraft carrier and warships conducting exercises. The, at this stage, United States and China are essentially on the brink of armed conflict. The corona world brought out US-China relationship to a worse level from blame game, economic coercion, and even closure of consulates. The Trump administration had banned several Chinese companies to a government list, citing their role as helping the China Chinese military constructing artificial islands in the South China Sea. All these relationships culminated in the South China Sea in terms of military reconnaissance, and China accused USA of provoking disputes in the region and pushing other countries to back its stance. Secondly, uh, Vietnam reiterates its inclination towards approaching international tribunal uh, during the COVID period. And third, Manila government also openly votes to call the United States if China attacks her Navy. Fourth, China being the second largest economy showed her skill as a practitioner of economic statecraft. The economy of Southeast Asia, as we know, is heavily dependent on China's economy. And ASEAN China, China economic ministers meet in July 2020, welcome the robust growth of their bilateral trade and investment and wish to cooperate further in the economic arena. For the first time, this year, ASEAN became China's lar largest trading partner this year. And fifth, China's proactive re reactions have brought the weaker nations and external power together. This is very clear. And taking example, Philippines recently affirmed the mutual defense treaty that they signed with the United States way back in 1951, to which both nations can support each other if either the Philippines or the or United States uh, are attacked by an, any external party. America strongly affirmed the support of Southeast Asian states, which they call it as natural allies. Last, China reiterates that it wished to solve the dispute, but only through bilateral means. But other weaker literal states wish multilateral forms of resolving dispute. At this stage, Countries of Southeast Asia are stuck in between US-China wars, and the South China Sea in, is increasingly turning into a gray zone. Uh, I will now con 
conclude my paper with this paragraph. Uh, recent years development in the South China Sea brings that territorial complexities got heightened and peaceful revolution uh, and peaceful solution of the conflict in the South China Sea is kind of hopeless in the near future. And it is also very difficult to draw a clear and um, clear prospect and future of the situation. But one thing must be considered that the South China Sea dispute is not a recent phenomenon and has its roots in the, even in the colonial period. During the early 20th century, the region was divided among four, four Western colonizers, Britain, French, Dutch, and the Americans. And if the situation gets worse, the world might witness the recurrence of history, which would possibly be regarded as the South China Sea as a zone of great power competition and conflict in the coming years. Existing situation proves that China will never back off from its claims. And on the other hand, USA will never allow to see China's domination in the South China Sea and its unlawful occupation. In the post-COVID world, it is clear that international pressure will be stronger on China. Above interstate disputes, fishermen of the littoral states will likely to face uh, more problems. And the crux of the matter is the resolution of conflict in the South China Sea in which parties have divergent views. As far as the conflicting parties are concerned, majority of the problems can be curbed at the diplomatic level. Now, the weaker parties are essentially running out of options. Rather than openly criticizing the bad manners of China to gain world public opinion and yelling support from external powers like the United States and at the last resort approaching international tribunal, which is much disliked by China. And ASEAN as the chief regional institution has also significant concern for peace and stability in the South China Sea. But problems remain the heavy economic dependence on China, restrain the weaker nations and ASEAN itself to take proactive measures. And only four of the 10 ASEAN, ASEAN members are parties of the South China Sea. And one thing that must be considered is the recent inclusion of China in the election of international tribunal, seven member judges. Mr. Jilong was elected as a member of international tribunal and to a considerable extent, it will have a clear implications whether it is good or bad. However, uh, anyone concerned with international relations knows well the, how the ineffectiveness of international law. Therefore, international tensions could rise significantly which would see, uh, which could jeopardize international peace and stability in the coming years. That's my presentation, sir, and thank you very much. Thank you, Siami. Uh, it's interesting uh, presentation because usual imagination is that China's bully behavior in South China Sea, at least, uh, is continuing unabated. But interesting to see the way she has presented to us that restraints on China uh, during and after COVID-19 are likely to be reinforced and therefore uh, there could be greater challenges for China to continue that kind of behavior. Uh, Siami, I request you to uh, now stop sharing your uh, slides with us. Uh, we only saw the one slide, I hope that was the purpose uh, of your presentation. Hopefully we didn't miss any of the other uh, slides. Uh, but I'm sure we will take uh, question answers uh, at end of four presentations. So those of you who were hearing to see me and wanted to uh, make a comment or uh, ask a question, please hold your horses as of now. Uh, we'll have those uh, intense discussions at end of uh, four presentations. I can see uh, the Dr. Uh, Swasti Rao is already with us today. Uh, again, uh, her brief introduction is uh, already sent to you and I'll invite her now to speak on what she says surveillance state security and pandemic uh, and it's a study of yes, China sir. and Russia uh, over to Swasti now please uh, start your presentation you have 15 minutes ideally but you can extend it up to 20 minutes 
Thank you, sir. That's so kind of you. Only one thing, I have already sent my presentations, you know, to Rostam. So if you could please start sharing and to water policy, I've mailed you as well as sent you in the private yeah. chat here. Rostam, you have so, that yeah. PDF, so, please uh, start sharing that. Yeah. So meanwhile, um, um, till the time that Rostam is doing his bit, uh, let me extend my thanks and uh, and definitely my gratitude to Professor uh, Swaran Singh. Uh, it's it I, like I always say when I see you one to one, it feels like a JNU classroom, and uh, you know so that is something which is very heartening. Um, thank you, sir, for the uh, for chairing our session and thank you, Nice, for this opportunity. Uh, today, um, I'm going to be sharing, uh, you know, my presentation is about uh, surveillance state uh, security and pandemic. Um, I think because there is so much and when the screen is, uh, and please just tell me, Rustam, when you start sharing the screen so that I come to know. Yeah. So uh, the other thing that I wanted to say before I start the presentation is that, you know, there is just so much talk these days about, uh, you know, the new world order and how the pandemic has changed the way we live, etc. Um, so that has got me thinking a lot about what really this holds in future for the way, you know, state and state control happens. So um, that is what is going to be, uh, you know, my, my presentation today. Rustam, are you are you sharing it? Uh, yes, uh, just two minutes. There, there are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No problem. No problem. So uh, till the time, you know, uh, he's doing it. So, like I said, so that is what my presentation is going to be all about. That it is this, this, uh, you know, this, this, this thinking and this thought which has surrounded um, what really should be the the nature of the state and where is it going, etc. Okay, in this date of, uh, in this day and age of surveillance and, uh, you know, the technology, etc. And definitely China came up to be an interesting study because uh, China, you know, is infamous for so many draconian surveillance laws. So I thought that getting that bit into the future of surveillance and the future of what the world is going to look like in the post pandemic era, and then seeing how Russia is also falling suit. You know, so those kind of things I thought could be interesting. And this is what, uh, you know, the presentation is going to be all about. Uh, Dr. Swati, we haven't received any presentation from your side. We just checked. Could you, could you just check your mail? We just or, checked our mail. Uh, so we... I have also sent you on the, on the private chat here. Swati, if you have it with you right available on the same uh, laptop, you could share it yourself. Okay, all right. I think Rustam maybe uh, if, if you get it, Rustam then... make her the co-host so that she can... She is the co-host already. Uh, uh, yes. okay. Do you see? Do you see yeah, the chat? Yeah, I, I just saw it. I, I downloaded it. I'll just... Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yes, you got it. Actually, I, I made it on a different phone. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Swasti, you can also share it yourself. Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, I would prefer Rustam doing it. It's on a different phone. But then if uh, it doesn't work out, then I will start sharing. Maybe you can deduct this time from the presentation no, no, if you so want. Don't, don't worry on that. Yeah. Rustam, are you, yes, are you yes, sharing? Yes, I, I got the presentation so, okay. I'm sharing. Yeah. Great. Yeah, all right. Okay. Yeah, is the presentation visible? Yes. Okay. Please go to the first slide. Okay. Let's start. Fine, that's great. So shall we start? And I will just tell you to change the slide, Rustam. So uh, please just, yeah, let's add uh, each other there on. So like I said, it is on state surveillance and security. Um, you know, it is, uh, and, and the pandemic, a study of China and Russia. Thank you so much for being patient with me. Uh, next slide, the, uh, which says the layout, yeah. So really, like I said, that, you know, today's presentation is about all this, that what really is this post-pandemic world order? Does it suggest a paradigm shift in the nature of world politics? So we keep hearing these things of deglobalization, okay, reculturalization, and return of the great power rivalry. Okay, so for, for uh, in, in an easier way, it could mean social distancing is going to become norm, masks and online work culture is going to become a part of our lives. Okay, so there are images of ghost towns of erstwhile city centers floating everywhere. But more fundamentally and less visibly, it is basically the nature of uh, state surveillance and its indispensability for security, which is coming up. 
okay so when i say when i say state surveillance okay what i really mean to say is the data surveillance you know the surveillance that you do by way of collecting huge amounts of data which cuts across both traditional and non traditional security threats so then the key ponderables become what is the nature of surveillance in our times in what direction is it going is it going in a very dystopian direction so to say what is the nature of state individual relationship and how is it going to unfold what is the nature of political obligations then and what are what then could be the limits to it and why am i speaking about china and russia so surveillance is a core function of all public health systems and this is with respect to pandemic responses to the covid-19 pandemic have deployed traditional public health surveillance responses such as contact tracing quarantine and you know they have extended these responses with the use of varied technologies such as the use of smartphones you know smartphone location data data networks drones big data analysis so what i've done in this regard is that in this particular presentation today i am going to revisit you know the grand old man of uh, political philosophy called michel foucault and his notion of panopticon with its twin focus on surveillance and self regulation as the preeminent form of social control in modern societies and with that we can in, in, you know examine the increasing level of surveillance enacted during these times and also for the pandemic in general so we will see how you know that is coming about and uh, you know to what extent can we apply foucault right with this uh, can we come to the next slide please uh the next slide says uh so we we are talking about how the post modern state surveillance and security in nation states are crossing all right um now what i want to tell you that capitalist societies there is surveillance in capitalist societies as well so it is not merely a problem of china or russia it is it is it is something which is all pervasive okay uh, yuval noah harari calls statism the new god the new religion so it is everywhere but the enfolding of it happens differently so in capitalist societies what we guess is surveillance capitalism where private human emotion is being dragged into the market and called behavioral data so human activity which was outside the market is brought inside the market and all aspects of human life become a data byte which can help a giant corporate's profit right and we must you must be remembering the cases of you know facebook etc being dragged to uh, you know the us uh, parliament and but in autocratic regimes like the ccp it goes several steps further and steps up the most sophisticated system of espionage over their own people and when i say espionage over their own people it's not just about minorities like the uyghurs but also the majority han chinese and we will see how so the pandemic situation what is what has happened is that the pandemic situation has legitimized the state surveillance and aids in the deepening of state control over the lives of citizens in unprecedented ways one of the post pandemic shifts can be seen in in the nation state itself which is you know backed by populism that has been strengthened because it has the power to in you know to to take decisions about healthcare and border control and stimulus plans right so it is this particular legitimization of the panopticon its state case you know which basically is a in my opinion you know the 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 hallmark of the post pandemic societies and there are two main types of power okay according to foco one is repressive power and the other is normalizing power so repressive power is the power that we that we all the time see which is the visible aspect of power okay which is like you know police and all that but normalizing power is the invisible overarching aspect okay and we will see how in the in the in the case of china the social credit system and internet firewalling come in that normalizing power which is in, invisible and overarching everywhere can we come to the next slide the fourth slide please so um then what have we come to by now is that control of information has been key in perpetuating the rule of ccp since 1949 sorry, so if you look at so still yes. you rustam you've gone two slides ahead please go backwards i'm going to slide four please is on how firewall works so no 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 i'm on i'm on slide four please please uh, rustam please could you follow when i say uh, you know Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. So yeah, slide four. So what I see that when we now when we look at China, right, uh, we see that the control of information has been key in perpetuating the rule of CCP since 1949. Whether it's suppression of minorities, cracking down on minorities, and especially after the Tiananmen Square, etc. 
So this particular suppression, etc., this this the way it is done in China is the most sophisticated surveillance system in the world. And you know, we keep hearing things of how Xinjiang is the biggest prison in the world. There are re-education of minorities, concentration camps, etc. But let me come to the most uh, you know more technical part of how these things are carried out. So one thing that we need to know then is how the great firewall of China works, which is the internet firewall, which is not just you know a simplistic banning of domains that you know you cannot access you cannot access a particular domain in China, but also to spy on internet behavior of their 1.4 billion people and accordingly then develop tactics to brainwash their population. So. But at the same time, there is a problem, which is that the great firewall is so great, but you know you can actually jump it by so purchasing I'm, certain VPNs. So so I'm sorry, this is yes. not working. He's he's again moved two slides ahead. Okay, I'm sorry that no, I, it's I not me doing. Uh, I don't know how, how did it happen. I'm just keeping. So you know how how. Firewall works is where you should stay. She's yeah. talking about. Okay. Yeah, please, please stay, stay to Sorry, please yeah. stay to slide four. Please no. stay to slide four. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. So um so but you know that is what I was telling you about the great firewall. That and please please make sure that you know we all stay to you know slide four. So uh, it is not merely simplistic banning, but also kind of you know watching the internet behavior of people and developing tactics to brainwash you know the population. So, like I said, that then how does it work? Because you can buy a few VPNs and jump that firewall. So the answer to this question then is more insidious and disturbing than the firewall itself. You know, how do you control the populations without giving them the impression that they are being controlled? So what has happened in China is that between 1994, when internet started there, to now, a massive state apparatus to control and monitor the internet has emerged. Orig and what is more disturbing is that originally it was controlled by the Ministry of Public Security and it was called the Golden Shield Project, which now is referred to as the Great Firewall. And the second thing that I want to discuss in this regard is the social credit system, which extends this power of gaze to include all kinds of data collection and visual surveillance. And we will see how. Can we come to the next slide, please? Slide five. How the firewall works. How the firewall works now what has happened is that you know there was a lot of uh, uh, you know i mean i won't take much time in this but then there was a lot of research on uh, you know how this firewall actually works okay so it's not merely banning but there are other strategies which are employed to make the firewall you know uh, have that effect that it has and you know in 2013 uh, american, american political science review published a particular finding and the conclusion was that contrary to much research and commentary the the purpose of the censorship, censorship program is not to suppress criticism of the state, but it does that, uh, you know, they are allowed to write scathing criticism of the government, but the purpose of the censorship program is to reduce the probability of collective action. Okay. And if we come to the next slide, slide six, okay, because I want to go a little quick. In slide six, we can see the way this is done, how the great firewall works, okay. It is how the censorship is happening in another book, you know, we can see that there are three ways in which this happens. One is by inculcating fear, which is that, you know, immediate, immediately effective, but not, uh, in, uh, but not very, not a long term, not, uh, not a long term strategy. The second is, I mean, by inculcating fear in the people. The second is by flooding, as in that when you're trying to find out a sensitive information, you are, you know, going to drown in a sea of delusional information. So ultimately, there will be so much confusion which will be created that after some initial effort, the person is going to give up. And the third way is called friction, which is that you increase the cost in terms of time or money. So there are the three Fs by which, you know, the internet, uh, you know, firewalling works, okay? So, like I said, because banning will be become is too black and white. Okay, so you can jump the VPN, but then you are the, the state is watching what you are doing. Can we come to the next slide, slide seven? And let me just tell you, yeah, system. Uh, yeah, slide seven. I just have two more slides to go, so I'm sorry. You know, the others we took a lot of time. Uh, is this perfect? Yeah. Slide seven. In slide seven, I'm discussing the second part, which is the social credit system, you know, which is, you know, because social credit system, it came about in around the 2018s and it is the dystopian, uh, so to say, uh, projection of what the Chinese state is capable of doing. 
So what is it? It, is, it started in 2014 and scheduled to be fully operational in 2020. What are they doing? What they are doing is that, you know, the Chinese government is giving away coins to its citizens for abiding by certain socially desirable behavior. And if you don't abide by certain behavior, if you do socially undesirable behavior, your coins are going to be taken away. So, you know, so many researchers have called it the game of life. Okay, so they call it that they are building trust, etc. But in reality, it is a state driven program designed to do one thing to uphold and expand Chinese Communist Party's power. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take questions later on this because you know, we're running out of time. So, um, and this is perfectly in line with how Chairman Mao has started, you know, to uh, perpetuate party's leadership, etc. So uh, just to give you a little thing, because uh, like, for example, recently, 9 million people in China with low scores were blocked from buying tickets for domestic flights. OK, so bad performers can have their Internet speeds delayed, etc., etc. And if you are blacklisted, you had it. OK, so let me come to the next slide. Um, slide eight. Now I'm coming to Russia and I won't have much time, so I'm willing to take more questions later. But what I want to say is that the key takeaway from what we've got in the Chinese experience is that, you know, the government is always watching. There is a constant gaze all the time there. OK, now, if you look at Russia, I'm going to skip it a little bit because I'm running out of time and I would rather come to come to the conclusion of what I want to present today, which is that Putin is also, you know, following uh, the same steps. Why? Because Putin is a dictator in a way and Putin is getting all the opponents killed. The news is coming almost every second, uh, you know, second, second year or after a few months. So Putin is also really very impressed with the Chinese, Chinese firewall. And uh, it started around 2014, 15, when, you know, in Russia, you saw a package of reforms happening called the Yarovaya laws, uh, named after Irina Yarovaya. And they were signed by Putin in 2016. And it was about, in short, you know, it was all about how to control the information that is flowing in the, in, in, in the society, and especially on uh, internet. And uh, why I'm saying that China and Russia, because Russia wants that technology from China. In fact, you'd be surprised that Huawei is the one that is actually guiding the Russian firewall system. Okay, so that is the kind of thing which is happening there. If you come to the next slide, slide nine. Uh, like again, this is just a little bit of a, you know, um, um, you know, update as to how Russia has been coming, I mean, after 19, 1991, and in the 2000s, Russia slowly has been becoming a very close society. Okay, so this is a little data that you can see on this. And a lot of, you know, uh, reporters without borders, etc. they list Russia um, as, as a country under surveillance, okay. And uh, since 2015, definitely Russia has been collaborating with China to have a Chinese Great Firewall kind of a system in Russia, so the Russian uh, Firewall, okay. Um, last slide, would you please come to my last slide, which is the conclusion. Uh, see, basically, I'm sorry, it got a little bit of a, uh, you know, uh, the, the technical glitches apart. What I mean to say is that, so the post-pandemic order is an order where we are having a great power rivalry. Okay. Now, great power, power rivalry in a classic international politics or a realist sense is a zero-sum game, right? But the, but the challenge right now if before us is to find a positive-sum approach to tackle the coronavirus situation in a new international idealism. Because for that, a new international idealism. Why do I say idealism of some sense? Because a, some sort of a humanitarian world order is required. Why? Because the, this, this monster of data, it cannot be tackled by profit motive. So there, there will be great power, power rivalry, but there will be a multiplicity of transnational factors. And we have to take all these things into consideration to really see where the future of state security and surveillance is going. Thank you so much for the patience. Thank you, Swasti. And uh, we can now wait for uh, questioning some of the propositions that Swasti has just made with us uh, till all four presentations uh, are over. I think there will be several questions. Uh, uh, it's a very controversial uh, issue that uh, Swasti has just shared her analysis on. Social credit system in, in China is uh, really, really you know, comprehensive. Uh, but China, of course, is not the first. 
you know, in US from 1989, credit score, and that's how uh, the credit card companies uh, are always so fashionable in US. Your credit score is really important in US to do any financial transactions, particularly to buy any uh, property, etc., or ask for any uh, debt, etc. Chinese have, of course, gone uh, completely in a different fashion of making it social credit system, not just financial credit system in that sense. So I'm sure we will have more questions or comments on the, that issue later. But as I say, please hold your questions. We have next speaker from South Korea. Mamika Kapoor is a fellow with Global Policy Insights and a PhD candidate at Yonsei University there. He's going to speak on US-China blame game on COVID-19. And I think that will give us some insights into the US as well. And I'm now requesting Mamika Kapoor to please start her 20 minutes presentation. Is Vamika Kapoor with us already? I don't see her on my screen. We'll move next to Yasin then. Yasin is a PhD candidate with School of International Studies at my university, JNU. And he's going to speak to us on China in the United Nations peacekeeping operations. What are the motivations and what are the contributions? I think that's another very interesting area where China has done a lot of PR work in highlighting its contributions uh, in terms of peacekeeping operations. So we are looking forward. Uh, Yasin, you have your 20 minutes now. Please uh, start. Am I audible? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. I want to begin by thanking the Chair Professor Swaran Singh and Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement and Water Policy Center for providing this academic platform to put forward my point on China's engagement in the United Nations peacekeeping. To be, to be more specific, my topic title goes like China in the United Nations, motivations and contributions. Well, according to the UN yearbook, China, of course, then the nationalist government was accorded the honor of being the first to sign the charter in Veterans War Memorial Building at San Francisco on June 26, 1945. Also, we all know that the Communist Party of China established the People's Republic of China in 1949, claiming to be the sole legitimate government of China. However, the People's Republic of China, uh, the People's Republic of China claimed the sole legitimacy in the United Nations. So I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, I have made a presentation. Yeah. Yeah. So, wait. Well, so uh, the Republic of China or Taiwan continued representing China in the United Nations for more than two and a half decades. Well, I hope uh, PPT slide is also visible to everyone. Yes, it is. So in the very beginning of my presentation, I'd like everyone to be attentive on this Google trend from 2004 until now. And as you can see, the trend of the subject, United Nations, is much of China's interest than any other P5 members. The first one on, on, your, on the left of your screen is the China. So we can see the graph is increasing, where other P5 members, the graphs are actually decreasing. And well, before moving to the next slide, let me also mention that I will first give a brief overview of China's inclusion in the highest multilateral organization and subsequently Beijing's contribution to the United Nations peacekeeping operations and finally discussing many driving elements factoring in China's active engagement to peacekeeping missions. Well, the People's Republic of China, after many decades of caution and at times absolute resentment towards the institution of UN peacekeeping, has in the past two decades greatly altered the policy. China posed an antagonistic stance towards the United Nations during the Korean War in 
And in this context, a prolific author on the subject, Luard noted, China at that time was like, love me or leave me, but do not leave me alone. From 1950 onwards until 1960, the assembly regularly considers a proposal from the Soviet Union for the inclusion of an agenda item on the matter of China's representation. This, however, was always rejected. And instead of a resolution, usually proposed by the United States, was passed in the assembly to postpone or not to consider the question of China's representation. Where communist China also to become a permanent veto wielding member of the Security Council that could, I fear, implant in the United Nations the seeds of destruction. That was a statement by then US Secretary of State, John Foster, in 1957. And later, after five years later, there was a statement by Soviet delegate to the UN General Assembly, Valerian Zorin, and I quote, those who speak out against the presence of the PRC within the UN have missed the buzz of history. And then following Indonesian withdrawal in 1965, Chinese official statement in People's Daily read, this so-called world organization needs to be thoroughly remolded. The United Nations is by no means sacred and inviolable. We can live, in, live on very well without it. It was published in People's Daily on January 10, 1965. However, Communist China started changing its stance following the conclusion of the 19, uh, 9th Party Congress in 1969. And only with the resolution 2758, the UN General Assembly on October 25, uh, 1971, restores all its rights to the People's Republic of China and to recognize the representatives of its government as the only legitimate representatives of China to the United Nations. And in the next slide, we can also see the voting pattern in 1907, where when China secured almost 58% of votes in its favor in 1971. And it was kind of abrupt rise, as you see, uh, from 1970 to 71. And China, after its inclusion or membership in the United Nations, first cast its veto on the issue of Bangladesh in 1972. It was probably initial boss approach because that time China was very new to the system. Though after that, China had been very reserved to veto in later period, given China's closed door policy and as a result of its great proletarian cultural revolution, the leadership of the Communist Party of China and Chinese policymakers remained exceedingly cynical on the issue of legitimacy of previous United Nations peacekeeping operations. As Chinese author Wang Tianwei observed, uh, and I quote, most of such UN actions were seen as interference in countries internal affairs and as the undesirable result of US-Soviet hegemonic power competition." Unquote. During the reforms and opening up policy, China began getting assistance from United Nations organizations from 1979 and Chinese representatives to China officially became a member of the United Nations Special Committee on Peacekeeping Operations following the Nobel Peace Prize awarded to UN Peacekeeping Forces in 1988. Accordingly, China sent its first deployment of civilian observers to Namibia in 1989. But as we all know, the Tiananmen incident in 1989 invited strictest possible condemnations and pressure from the international community and with the fear of being isolated, increasingly rising for China. The post-Cold War situation made the international community see China as the only remaining socialist state and the US as sole superpower in the global order. Policymakers failed that China needed the UN more than at any other period since 1945. It was also the time when China was indeed looking for opportunities in order to uh, buttress its image and a request for dispatching peacekeepers proposed by then even Secretary General Botrus Ghali gave China big relief. It is interesting to mention that during the Asian financial crisis in 1997, China gained the opportunity to project its image as a responsible country, a phrase coined by then Premier Churunji by not devaluing its currency. Therefore, it was thought 
prudent to support and participate in peacekeeping to better serve a political image under global criticism. In the next slide, we can also look at the vetoes by P5 members and we see that there are few vetoes. We can also see the color red. Uh, so far, China has vetoed 14 times. So uh, these are the questions uh, very specifically regarding my topic today, uh, China's overall engagement in the peacekeeping. And I'm looking at these four questions. How does China contribute in the United Nations peacekeeping operations? How do China's national interests and global presence shape its behavior in peacekeeping operations? What are the challenges for China's strong adherence of the principles of state sovereignty and non-interference? Next. Uh, so these are the numbers. So talking for China's peacekeeping contributions, as we can see, China is the top peace, uh, peacekeeping troop contributor among P5 members. And China attained this position in, 19, uh, in, in 2004. And from 2002 to 2019, the increase of Chinese peacekeeping troops who are wearing blue helmets for United Nations peacekeepers, uh, the, the increase is 26 fold. And China is currently participating in seven of 13 ongoing peacekeeping missions. And also, uh, as September 2019, the total 2,534 Chinese troops are, 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 are uh, contributing in China, in UN peacekeeping operations. And secondly, thirdly, the China is the largest, second largest budget contributor in the UN, United Nations. This is, uh, I also want to highlight here that um, in 2016, China's contribution to the UN budget was 6.8%. And in 2017, 17, 18, it was 10.21%. But in 2020, China has increased its budget uh, contribution to the UN peacekeeping at 15.21%. So we, as we see the numbers, so what are the key factors of China's reluctance to reduce approach? And so basically uh, there are uh, seven, eight points, elements which are factoring in China's enthusiastic participation in the United Nations peacekeeping operations. Firstly, safeguard national interest, uh, recent Chinese actions, uh, articles, official statements indicate that the continuity of deeper engagements in UN peacekeeping as interrelated elements and considerations for the Chinese leadership and the People's Liberation Army, PLA. Chinese author Yong Chin Chang claims in the 1990s, China shifted its policy from a condemnation point to participation in UN peacekeeping. In 2000, Chinese peacekeeping policy is more flexible in nature and started supporting non-traditional peacekeeping activities. The International Crisis Group, ICG, report tries to locate the motivations of China's involvement in five areas, namely multilateralism, responsible power, operational benefit, China's interest abroad, and one China policy. So there are multifaceted reasons for China's increasing involvement in, in these peacekeeping operations since realistic contemplations and policy priorities are at play in Chinese peacekeeping. From its national interest point of view, as uh, Chinese author Fang he wrote an article on, in 2005 and he observed, China needs a stable environment and peaceful market for its sustainable economic development and modernization. This is very interesting given the uh, information that China is the largest trading partner for almost 130 countries. And Africa and Middle East are two energy producing and supplying regions for China. Instability there doesn't serve China's interest. Probably that is why most of the Chinese peacekeeping is concentrated in Africa. In the context of national interest, Yasuhira Matsuda located three kinds of interest, namely international interest, soft national interest, and hard national interest. Another venue of China's engagement in peacekeeping can be located in its military domain deployment of large number of troops 
and police forces helps China professionalize its force with practical benefits and technical skills. This is very important. As you see, that China last waged its war in 1979, the Vietnam War. So this also offers scope for Chinese PLA to professionalize and to professionalize its 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 army. In recent years, multilateralism has evolved to become crucial pillar in Chinese foreign policy. Uh, as, you, as you know that uh, there were Chinese foreign policy mainly based on like three plus, the major power relations, developing country relations and neighboring country relations. And after the 16th party Congress in 2002, China also added two more elements, namely multilateralism and soft power in its overall foreign policy. And participation in UN peacekeeping is viewed a low cost approach of exhibiting dedication and commitment to global peace and safekeeping. To security challenges, China's engagement in peacekeeping is to consolidate multilateral means to overcome security deficiencies. Participation benefits China's influence or what Chinese call it Huayu Chuan within these missions. Therefore, China gets an enhanced position in the UN system, which is advantageous for China's China to diplomatically actually profit. From China's foreign policy point of view, peaceful rise was highly advocated by the Chinese leadership. Jiang Zemin political report at the 16th at the 16th CCP Congress stressed the dramatic changes in international relations which had served to justify China's change of attitude about peacekeeping operations. China officially took part in the class A standby preparation mechanism offering medical engineering and transport personnel to peacekeeping activities. And finally, uh, peacekeeping as a soft power. As we know that Joseph Nye conceptualized soft power or second phase of power as the ability to attract, persuade others or winning others gratitude through attraction and co-option contrary to hard power that emanates from inducement and coercion Countries can magnetize others by the means of culture, institutions, policies, political values, and ideals. Nine, in order to give more elaboration of soft power, pointed out the ability to attract and attraction often leads to acquiescence. Here we need to be clear about the dissimilarity of attraction and influence. Well, uh, uh, so. United Nations peacekeeping operations, how it's serving China's soft power. Uh, very quickly, the activities in United Nations, especially in peacekeeping operations to the uh, help China promote its soft, uh, soft power. Among major reasons for the involvement in United Nations peacekeeping and peace negotiation, one aim is to project the image of a responsible, generous, and peace-loving country in the global setup, thus increasing its image and subsequently soft power in general. The most crucial proportions of peacekeeping are connected with soft power discourse. If you look into the UN generated good country index, GCI, China's overall ranking is 64. But in the section of international peace and security, China is ranked 16th. The, the reason behind this spectacular ranking in this section is among five indicators to belong to United Nations peacekeeping operations. And peace missions encourage mutual political trust and military transparency. Interactions with foreign counterparts benefit China to nurture the image that China's military development is not a threat to global peace and security. Here, Chinese participation has also appeared to be conducive to counter the China threat concept. A statement from the Minister of National Defense clarified on July 2010 that Chinese peacekeeping with humanitarian relief has been indicated that Chinese military was more inclined to become a positive force. Chang Shirley. And the last part, I'd like to conclude it. China has an opening to lead internationally and in peacekeeping in part because the United States and other permanent members have shown a lukewarm approach in their interest in contributing peacekeeping troops despite the US putting the largest deal for the peacekeeping budget. Peacekeeping is commensurate with China's foreign policy goals and given the comfort China is enjoying 
currently its participation in the eu and peacekeeping is likely to consolidate and in the coming years peacekeeping activities and initiatives can be seen as an useful tool for china to realize its ambition of peacekeeping of becoming a responsible great power thank you thank you yasin uh, you can now uh, stop sharing your presentation i should rectify that the list that i had was uh, including homika kapoor but we have now the fourth speaker of our session uh, dr shaya pande she is formerly the fellow of uh, nehru memorial museum and library which is a very prestigious institution in new delhi she is going to speak to us very interestingly on an area which was missing in the session so far we have spoken about uh, russia we have spoken about china but european union was missing so she is going to speak to us on european union and the pandemic and share with us uh, what had been their uh, response and what has been their preparedness in dealing with covid-19 as we all understand that after china european countries like spain and italy were the greatest uh, the, you know victims of uh, the pandemic so we look forward to uh, listening to dr shaya pande please sir uh, you can start now for your 20 minutes dr pande yes thank you so much sir um, uh, thank you to the organizers for giving us an opportunity to express ourselves uh, indeed my topic is a little different and uh, it is more on the positivist side i will be talking empirically as to what is actually happening on the ground um i as i already stated i am going to talk about the european union and how it is dealing with the pandemic now why are indian scholars interested in the eu that is the first thing that comes to our mind why are we studying the european union not many of the scholars are really interested in the european union i must confess but nevertheless uh, there are solid uh, reasons for that because european union happens to be the largest trading partner of india 12.9% of india's trade is with the european union so 115 uh, billion dollar trade happened in 2018 2019 between eu and india and our trade is fairly balanced uh, with uh, 58 billion euros uh, of uh, imports and uh, 57 billion euros of uh, exports and the same uh, applies to services besides european union also happens to be the largest source of fdi for india amounting to 73 billion euros but of course then it uh, this pales into insignificance when uh, we look at how much the european union is investing in china which is 178 billion euros um, just last year uh uh well um as far as eu and india are concerned uh, this is an essentially economic relationship in essence however an fta surprisingly has still not been concluded between eu and india and uh, we recently had a summit just last month on 15th of july between the two partners of course it was a virtual summit um because of the covid-19 overshadowing everything uh, and um, there uh, we could actually see a change in tenor a change in the tempo of um, what was being said between the two partners of course why was this change uh, so visible it was because of the covid-19 pandemic and so the two sides actually stated that they would come together and uh, they would come together to protect lives and mitigate the socio economic consequences of the pandemic by sharing open transparent uh, openly and in a transparent manner all information and also ensuring better coordination at the international level through organizations such as who and um, the two sides also identified synergies through shared capacities experiences and um, strengths uh, in order to in the field of manufacturing of pharmaceuticals and vaccines healthcare r&d and diagnostics and treatment the two sides were also very clear that they actually wanted that once this uh, covid-19 vaccine is created it, it comes into existence it is it is declared a public good so that it is made available to all 
and therefore clearly the eu and india want to collaborate in the area of healthcare and pandemic response and preparedness they also stated that they would like to continue the vital supplies uh, of um, uh, medicines as well as agricultural products and goods and services now the european union also held summits with china and south korea at about the same time and they were also confabulating on this very issue when we come to the european union now they have actually been trying to formulate a common european response as we know the eu is a block of 27 member states uh, the european countries basically 27 european countries and it is the most uh, developed regional uh, international organization so to say and every regional organization tries to simulate what they are actually doing so um, of course they have come up with a number of best practices which includes um, coordinating the national responses of the member states they are providing objective information as to what is happening on the ground to the member states and also trying to take effective action as far as possible to control the pandemic the european commission uh, which executes all the policies has actually formed at the political level a response team in order to coordinate between the various nation member states now uh, a picture of european solidarity is being painted and i think there is a lot of truth in what uh, they are actually conveying they are basically stating that um, the eu solidarity is being exhibited uh, through various actions such as the treatment of uh, ill eu citizens uh, in other countries so cross border transfers of patients who are ill is happening um then there is there is there are a lot of donations being made for the uh, uh, personal protection equipments and the stranded eu citizens uh, in other countries of europe can easily find their way back to their homes uh, now when we come to the budget of the european union in order to control this pandemic uh, the eu has a very uh, long multi annual financial framework so the current budget is for from 2021 to 2027 so 50% more than 50% a little more than 50% of this budget is being dedicated for uh, uh, dealing with this pandemic and uh, apart from this uh, there is something that they have come up with uh, called the new generation eu which actually is a huge huge corpus of fund of about 750 billion euros which includes 390 billion of grants and 360 billion of loans so all this money uh, added together actually uh, comes up to a whopping 1.8 trillion euros dedicated for the control of this pandemic so we see that their uh, dedication their commitment towards controlling this pandemic is certainly very very serious um when we come to certain initiatives being taken by the european union uh, for controlling the pandemic we can enumerate quite a few for instance they are actually funding not less than 23 research projects under their uh, research and innovation program which is called horizon 2020 um so obviously they are trying to come up with solutions that can actually help an individual live a better life in the eu as well as in the rest of the world so they are trying to find possible solutions they are also collaborating with other countries in this respect then when we come to uh, the medical sphere uh, they are actually they just signed two days back uh, a contract with moderna which is a biotechnological company which aims at uh, uh, drug development uh, drug discovery and vaccine technology and they are supposed to supply to the european union 80 million doses of the vaccine of the covid-19 vaccine once it comes uh, once it is created and there is also provision for a another 80 million doses so you can imagine how much preparedness uh, the european union is aiming at and it is not just one company that they have signed this contract with they have signed it with other companies 
companies such as uh, AstraZeneca, Johnson and Johnson, CureVue, and uh, Sanofi, um, and they are still in the process of further negotiating with even more producers. Now, why are they doing this? Because they have a very clear vaccination strategy, which aims at making the European Union self-sufficient as far as dosages of uh, vaccination is concerned in about 12 to 18 months. So they have a target, they have a timeline, and they are definitely working on it. Uh, then um, uh, funding is also being done for transportation of medical equipment, medical personnel, as well as patients. Uh, then they have also uh, purchased not less than 10 million uh, masks for their health workers. And uh, they have also, uh, um, from their very uh, beginning, they have actually been making arrangements for the medicines that have been certified for treatment of COVID-19, uh, they have made provisions for making this available. They have also come with a reserve of medical equipment called Rescue. Uh, the EU uh, is what uh, they actually stress upon when they say rescue. Uh, this is actually a stockpile of vital medical supplies, including ventilators and face masks, so that whichever country, uh, whichever member state is in need of it, it can be supplied by the European Union. Uh, then when it comes to vital supplies, the things have to still go on despite the pandemic. So, uh, the European Union insisted that all EU members always make air cargo operational so that essential supplies can be reached to all the various countries and the member states. Besides this, they also have a trans-European transport network. And so what they ensured was that the, broad, the border crossings um, uh, among all the countries are designated as green lanes and freight traffic is not stopped at all so that the essential supplies are available to the people at all uh, times. Then um, they also uh, made, uh, they did a commendable job of bringing back citizens, EU citizens, about 500,000 EU citizens were brought back from various countries where they had been stranded when the pandemic actually broke out. Then the European Union has also come up with a web uh, with a web platform called uh, Reopen uh, EU, and uh, they are trying to uh, gradually, uh, safely open and encourage free movement as well as tourism within the European Union. Apart from this. Uh, um, as part of coordination among the European uh, member states, they are also trying to facilitate travel uh, to the European Union. Uh, they have also, uh, they also organized a pledging summit where they were able to raise 6.15 billion. They uh, actually called it very interestingly, a global goal, unite for our future. And uh, 4.9 billion was actually contributed by the European Investment Bank itself, and 485 million uh, euros were actually contributed by the EU member states. So they have also, and the citizens also volunteered, they also pulled in a lot of money so that the vaccine uh, is a uh, very quickly, very easily uh, made available to all once uh, it is developed. Then uh, the EU has also come up with a, a EU COVID-19 data platform where information regarding research uh, can actually be um, shared and collected and therefore a body of knowledge, of authentic knowledge is also being made, is also being created and constructed and built by the European Union, which is again very commendable. When we come to the economic measures uh, that are being taken, of course, uh, the economic condition has taken a beating. The Euro area's GDP plunged uh, by 12% uh, quarter on quarter, uh, three months to the end of June and uh, Spain um, uh, actually had a decline, registered a decline of 18%, France 14%, Italy 12% and Germany 
uh, 10%. So obviously a lot needs to be done in order to refurbish their economic standing. So the European Union has actually facilitated uh, making things better, making things easier for these countries by uh, tweaking uh, or maybe just bending the rules a bit for the capital market so that investment continues to spur the uh, economic operations. And um, uh, then the taxes can actually be filed a little later. Seasonal workers and farmers have been given special incentives. Banks are being asked to give loans, not only to businesses, but also to households. And uh, the EU Stability and Growth Pact actually has an escape clause, which when approved will allow the EU member states to uh, take certain measures within their own countries that would under normal circumstances circumstances be considered to be a departure from the budgetary requirements of the multi uh, financial framework. But uh, however, because these are uncertain times, um, uh, because these are uncertain times, uh, they are actually taking these uh, unprecedented measures. Uh, then uh, 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 a lot is also being uh, uh, done um, in various areas such as public health, uh, disaster uh, management and uh, solidarity. Um, and we can see a lot being done for uh, in the case of digitalization in order to make things better. And um, we also see a lot being done uh, in the sphere of travel and transport. So um, all in all, these are the various measures being taken by the European Union in order to make things better and in order to control the pandemic. Now, uh, of course, um, when we come to the numbers uh, as far as the pandemic is concerned, um, 21 lakh 41 thousand people have been uh, have been infected by the coronavirus in the European Union. The fatalities are 1,81,000 as of 28th August. So these are the data which they regularly revise every single day and we come to know about the figures. Now when it comes to country-wise fatalities, um, Britain uh, leads um, 41, there were 41,000 deaths there, uh, followed by Italy, 35,000. France, 30,000, Spain, 28,000. So what we are seeing here is we've heard so much about Spain and Italy in the media and the newspapers about the sheer horror and about the mismanagement in Britain. But we haven't heard much about France in India. Uh, this basically hints at, you know, uh, it might be selective representation by the media of what we uh, read and what we get to read. And um, then uh, another interesting aspect which I saw when I saw the data was that uh, Belgium uh, recorded 9,800 fatalities, Germany 9,000 fa uh, fatalities, but we always, um, uh, at least um, e even in the Western media, Germany's case was uh, highlighted as to be exceptionally good in handling the pandemic while the others were relegated to the background. Uh, so uh, this can be uh, touted as a selective representation or manipulation of data as, as we uh, choose to see it. And uh, another thing was that uh, Netherlands actually uh, recorded a fatality of 6,000 deaths while uh, Sweden had 5,800 uh, deaths. Uh, so, but Sweden is actually drawing a lot of flack because they did not actually adhere to the lockdown regulations very, very strictly. So, uh, but then we see that uh, even Netherlands is not far away as far as the fatalities are concerned. So, um, it is sometimes important to look at the data in a holistic manner in order to understand the situation on the ground. Now I come to the last part. Uh, we have, we are again seeing a spike uh, because the lockdown restrictions are, uh, they have come down, but these spikes are localized this time. Of course, the numbers are more in case of Spain and the Balkans in Europe, um, but uh, there are single digit uh, rises in Germany, Italy and France. Uh, another important thing that has to be noticed, as I pointed out earlier, that these are localized spikes. For instance, in Spain, this is happening in Aragon and in Catalonia, where one fifth of the population resides. In Italy, 
it, it is happening in Emilia uh, Romagno, which is a place where 7% of the Italian population resides. So these are very local. Now, what is the change in this uh, second round of spikes is that now tracing is faster. Testing is also quicker and more frequent and therefore the authorities are actually taking localized measures. For instance, as soon as uh, they saw that in Belgium, in Antwerp, uh, things are worsening, they impose a nighttime curfew, ask people not to go out as much as possible and also uh, made it compulsory for people to wear masks. In Catalonia, um, uh, uh, there's a, uh, in Spain, there is actually a city called Leiden where with a population of uh, 144,000 people and a curfew was strictly imposed there. In Barcelona, nightclubs were asked to shut down or close early. In Germany, we could see COVID clusters coming up in uh, pubs, in clubs, in uh, private gatherings, in home cares. And therefore, what they did was they imposed localized lockdowns. So uh, what do we mean by this? That wherever there is a problem the lockdown was imposed as simple as that and uh, uh, now yeah, you, can another, it, yeah. you can take yes, about two more minutes yes sir, yes sir. Sure. Uh, and uh, another um, interesting uh, thing that we can see as part of the new pattern is that those infected are in their 20s and 30s so these are not the old people who are more vulnerable so why is this happening? Because of course, this young generation is not adhering to the norms. They are not uh, hesitant in going to public spaces and private gatherings. And if they continue to do so, as many leaders, especially in Germany, have warned, uh, they will actually in no time start infecting uh, the old and the vulnerable and the aged. And then things might just go out of hand. Another uh, point of um, worry is that uh, once the summer ends and the autumn begins, most people will um, can, will start uh, staying inside and then there are a lot of flu symptoms that arise and uh, there is a tendency of people in Europe to fall sick more and the hospital beds are also found to be uh, occupied. So if this uh, coincides with a spike in COVID-19 uh, infections in various parts, this might actually prove to be a difficult time. But of course, uh, this time round, the European Union is more prepared. Uh, as a result of the slew of measures that we just discussed, there are more hospital beds and uh, there are even more um, field hospitals that have actually come up. But of course, again, everything will uh, zero in on how much and for how long do the people adhere to the new norms which have uh, been set, uh, which, which have actually come to govern our lives in the new normal. And uh, with this, I will uh, uh, conclude my uh, presentation by only stating that uh, the European Union has definitely proven that it is indeed a normative power. It has introduced a number of best practices which can be emulated by the rest of the world. And as far as uh, international political theory um, is uh, concerned, I would say what I see is a mishmash of uh, economic liberalism, mercantilism, and neo-Marxism. Uh, but I would actually subscribe more to the uh, mercantilist approach where we are actually seeing more of the same. So we are seeing more continuity in the new change. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sher, uh, for including European Union in your discussion. Uh, I think that's an interesting uh, area that we had not uh, kind of covered it uh, as yet. So I'm sure there'll be many questions uh, on that as well. I have my own set of questions, but I'll come and ask questions only after all the participants uh, have had their share of asking questions to you. Uh, let me uh, set few ground rules uh, as we begin to now move to next uh, segment of question answers. Uh, one is that I see that we have now 22 people with us. Uh, and I would uh, request, and I've been saying it earlier, uh, please switch on your videos. Uh, that is a facility we all have. So let's not treat this as a radio program. Uh, let us treat it as a audio visual program so that we still feel that sense of being
being together and uh, being face to face as much uh, new normal as we can. So I'll request all of you to switch on your videos uh, unless you have some uh, technical limitations. So I will uh, be willing to accept that there is a technical limitation, especially if you wish to intervene and uh, wish to ask your question. I would then expect you to not only switch on your videos, but also introduce yourself as to what is your affiliation, what is your background, and what is your own research interest, so that the speaker has an idea from where the question or comment is coming from. And uh, as I always say, you can either do electronic hand, if some of you are familiar, you are joining webinars, so you, you could uh, press on electronic hand, I will be able to see your request on my screen and I will give you the time to intervene. Uh, if you're not familiar with how to uh, do that electronic hand, you could just raise your physical hand like the way I'm doing now. Uh, so if I miss it uh, for once, you could raise it again until I uh, nod to you or I, or I say, yes, I've seen your hand. And I would like this to be really intense one-to-one -one discussion. So each question will get an answer. No need to bunch questions. We have about 20 minutes uh, still in our hand. Uh, the request that came to me first uh, was from someone called Shahir. Now, I'm not even aware of uh, the surname or whether it is the doctor or man or woman. Uh, I can now see uh, her screen on. Uh, so Shahir, please uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and then uh, make your intervention either in a form of a comment or asking a question, please. And also indicate to whom you are asking the question. Hello. Yeah, am I audible? Yes, you are. Please go. Ahead. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sheher Sheikh. Uh, I have done my master's in social work from Mumbai University. And currently, I'm working in MCGM, BMC, as a coordinator. Yeah. So from past one uh, year, I'm working in MCGM uh, in BMC. I have completed my master's in social work from Mumbai University on 2019. So my question is with the Dr. Swasti. So the, my question with her is that uh, as a healthcare worker, when we are dealing with the pandemic situation such as COVID, so while we are dealing with it like from last six months, so each day there are new guidelines which keeps on coming from the uh, head offices. So what, uh, how to strategize that and how to make it better use for the people when we are dealing at the field level. Okay, thank you for the question. Am I audible to you? Okay, all right. Uh, see, first of all, I don't think I'm technically qualified to uh, kind of uh, answer this question, to answer this question to you, but still I'll try. I think um, your question uh, comes, um, it, it's just something that, that really concerns each and every person in this world, you know, who is uh, having to undergo the stress of the COVID situation. I think uh, more specifically, I would like to just, you know, uh, say a couple of points about it. Uh, yes, um, healthcare workers and healthcare professionals are at a structural vulnerability um, during COVID because of the sheer scale, or, you know, of this contagious disease, A. Um, and the, while w there is little that we can do about it, you know, by way of, uh, you know, uh, by way of um, like a, a one sustainable decision, because, you know, the, 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 the guidelines keep changing, etc. But what we can understand is that if we really identify that there is a structural vulnerability, uh, you know, to healthcare workers, um, then it makes us somewhere more sensitive to how we should be dealing with the healthcare workers, A. And B, more importantly, and something that I can tell you from a different angle, which is that, you know, these days the, there is so much, uh, so much money which is being allotted, okay, uh, you know, to, to different districts within India for purchasing the PPE kits, for example, right, the personal protective equipment PPE kit. And, uh, you know, again, we are seeing the way we, the way that we are, that we are again trying to sort of manipulate the COVID situation into this, uh, you know, this, this, this typical old style thing of who is going to get that 
uh, order from the government, all right? And it is really getting played out, and especially in the smaller cities and the badlands of UP and those kind of states, it's it's really getting played out in a very, I would say, uh, a really, really a very disturbing manner. So I think we need to sort of at least first of all there is structured of the structural vulnerability if there is not much that we can do that we can at least ensure that the ppe kits that they are getting should be of the highest uh, you know quality available uh, and possible in in our times and the second thing um, you know that we need to do is that we need to reduce very clearly and speaking from indian experience we need to very clearly work towards reducing the violence and stigma against being a healthcare worker all right so to think that because that person is coming back from a hospital so is a potential carrier of uh, you know coronavirus and hence stigmatizing the person for it it is just adding uh, i would say uh, you know salt just rub rubbing salt on the food so these are a couple of very clear things that i can say and you know trying to reduce the working hours or maybe reduce the psychological hazards that are there i think other than that um, i'm i don't really i can't really give you a very clear cut answer i think the government also doesn't have one so I hope this answers your question to some extent. Thank you. Thank you, Swasti. Uh, the next question has come because I see already on my screen a hand is up. Louis Barentes is uh, going to ask the next question. Please unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself and also tell us who your question is addressed to. Louis Barentes. We can't hear you, Louis. There we go. Uh, I was trying to unmute. See, I mean, yes. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, for um, such incredible presentations and very informative. Uh, my name is Luis Barantes. I am from Costa Rica. Um, I've been doing a little bit of research on Yemen recently. And uh, two years ago, I was an intern at the Costa Rica Mission to the United Nations and was a little bit involved in the um, peacekeeping operations and uh, peace and security related matters. So that is why my question goes straight to uh, Yashin. Um, I would like to know uh, if we could have a little bit more insight uh, and also uh, taking a little bit on the question that Dr. Subhasti Rao made on the um, role of China on the Horn of Africa and Gulf of Aden. So we could have a little bit more of insight on that, uh, on, the, on the role of China as a uh, one P5 member of the UN Security Council of how the approach uh, through the, uh, towards the um, Yemen conflict has been. And also if we could also have a little bit more on, on comments about the uh, renewal of the mandate of the UNIFIL, especially considering today's uh, vote and, and also the remarks that Ambassador Kelly Craft to the uh, US Ambassador Kelly Craft to the United Nations gave on the UNIFIL renewal and everything. So if we could have some more of insight on them based, based uh, because um, it is one of the most important, um, uh, let's say, models currently uh, based on the, on the situation that happened, unfortunately happened in Lebanon. So we could have some more insight on how is the, the approach and also the role of China, in, especially in these two uh, concerns. Thank you very much. Yes, Yasin. Uh, thanks, Louis Bertas. Thanks for your question. And I think uh, in the text in the chat, I can also see a question by Dr. Swasti Rao. So I think the first question of Swasti Rao, I can clap together the two questions. And of course, like uh, in, in China, like China's uh, activities in Africa, especially in, in the Horn of Africa. So we see its overall security presence in the continent. Well, uh, until the last two or three decades, China had been enthusiastic to play a major role in African security. But during the Cold War, it had been uh, transferred weapons to non-state actors. China mostly emphasized non-interference and advertised South-South cooperation. China has tried to address security crisis in the continent only through the mechanism of even. However, uh, ever since in 1990s, the West has started criticizing China for selling arms that actually fueled conflicts and became um, the reason for various human rights abuses in Africa. The, the West uh, also questioned the nature of economic ties between China and Zimbabwe or Darfur, which had no strings attached. 
So I think in this respect, uh, of course, although China doesn't acknowledge, but in recent years, we, they have started actively intensifying its presence in African peace and security matters, building a base in Djibouti. Uh, this, 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 the agreement between China and Djibouti, uh, if you see, which would, would permit China to use its port in African country for naval operations. So, uh, and there, there was also one comment by Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi during his visit in Djibouti, it was around 2014 or 15, I'm not really sure about the year. So then he said that China also appreciates this Djibouti support and is willing based on this to carry out um, the most stable and long-term cooperation with Djibouti. So, uh, so China's engagement in paper, mostly it's been uh, non-interference and that's, that's also uh, one incentive for China which actually gets the support of African Union in the United Nations. And, but, you know, these this, this African countries and, uh, have a, had a good impression about China that they're very non-interference in their domestic affairs. But again, uh, it, it, it was until the time China dispersed combat troops in, in, in to South Sudan in 2013. That was the first time China actually contributed combat troops. Before that, mostly engineering uh, or medical staff. So, so this 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 non-interference, which is going through, as you're questioning, uh, it, it is going through a, a litmus test in South Sudan, uh, as this as this one region where China has huge huge commercial interest in investments. And this is also. Uh, slightly shift from China's foreign policy. If you, if you say that Tang Shafin theory that don't take leadership, Hu Tang Ho. So now it's uh, after Hu Jintao era, now Xi Jinping era. So they are actually striving for achievements. So I think this, this image is somehow being uh, shadowed by its China's over, over presence and in the security arenas. So well, apart from this economic interest and all these things, what are the main uh, strategic interests for China? China's strategic interest, uh, number one, of course, uh, military to military. Uh, the, the military ties are found on the ground of um, the form of donation of equipment, weapon sales, um, education, training programs. China sells actually arms to Ethiopia, Namibia, Cameroon, and Tanzania. And uh, then, of course, non-traditional threats. Uh, Chinese leaders have highlighted these anxieties in the course of decision-making of non-traditional threats. And the Chinese uh, may have initiated deployment of a hospital ship named Peace Ark to help soldiers in overtime. So the PLA, uh, Chinese People's Liberation Army, is only stepped up in addressing the humanitarian crisis in Africa. So if we, we, we have also seen the during the outbreak of Ebola, and the Yellow Fever, Chinese help was hugely appreciated. And uh, so apart from this soft approach, which is being pervaded by Chinese side and received by Africa, there's also reservations on its overall presence. And so that's the first question, uh, the answer of my first, the first question. And then it was also not very clear the last part of Lou Batre's question, the recent activities, but I think there's also a little difference in terms of approach. Uh, in If you see the Western approach and Chinese approach. So from a principal angle, uh, Western approaches endorse the promotion of democracy, while China is very much into assistance oriented, orientation or development. They actually want to sell the economic model China doesn't want to have a new election or new democratic force in the country. Chinese engagement remains responsive. Okay. West responsive, uh, West in peacekeeping has been very preemptive. So that's also very primary difference between two, two approaches. Uh, and so the Western method of peacekeeping, peacekeeping is both a top-down and bottom-up management as they move after instituting a new constitution conducting national elections, solidifying civil society, and creating political space for multi-party system. So with these methods, Western perspectives sometimes appear a big challenge for local ownership. And in China's participation, we see a glaring shortage of public participation. So yeah, that's it. OK. Uh, thank you, Yasin. Uh, 
let me share with Loyena. He comes from Costa Rica. He said it's a beautiful country. I used to go and teach at uh, UN University of Peace. Uh, used to go there two months uh, every year for about three years. And then I had to stop because I couldn't, uh, you know, avail that kind of leave every time. So, thank you for joining. Where are you right now? Joining from Costa Rica or some other place? We can't hear you. Yeah, yes. So yes, uh, basically, uh, currently I'm in Costa Rica. Um, well, as I said before, uh, two years ago I was I was entering at the termination of Costa Rica to the UN. Currently, I am um, being a candidate for a, a master's degree program with a, in a joint partnership between Universidad de Costa Rica and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Costa Rica on diplomacy. And yes, basically. Um, I am very interested about these uh, topics and I'm really glad of your words about our country and about your experience here in UN, uh, in UN Peace here in, in Costa Rica. And well, very glad to see you all here in, in Costa Rica if there comes a Thank time you. and if... Thank the... Yes? Thank you, Louis. Thank you, Louis, mm -hmm. for joining us uh, from uh, Costa Rica. Uh, Swasti, you would like to add something to what uh, Louis was asking? Because you also work um, for China. <laughs> yes, sir. I think um, uh, because since we are having the discussion, um, uh, to what Louis was asking, because he was asking about Chinese uh, intervention and presence in, Af uh, in Africa. And uh, incidentally, I asked Yasin the same thing. I think uh, one thing he already made clear, Yasin, that, um, you know, um, but okay, for, let me first just tell you my submission, which is that when you talk of United Nations peacekeepers, Chinese United Nations peacekeepers serving under the blue helmet in Africa, they are definitely there to, uh, you know, to propagate the UN mandate, you know, the Security Council mandate. Okay, so there they are not really uh, propagating the Chinese mandate or so. But if you look at plan, and if you look at, uh, you know, uh, the other ways in which the Chinese are there, they are obviously there with the very clear intention of uh, upholding the Chinese mandate which is that they don't really like to interfere much. And, uh, you know, they, they are more interested in simply getting economic benefits out of it and, you know, to protect their own ceilings of communication. So they have this uh, different bases uh, everywhere. Okay, like that. Um, the, the question that I was uh, wanted, wanting to ask you, uh, Yasin especially, and I think it would also take into account some part of Louis' question also, is that having said that, that remains a reality on paper or on theory, but while doing your research, I can see it is it is a part of your research because you've gone in so extensively about it. Uh, have you seen some sort of positive correlation between the fact that if China has, and you took the example of South Sudan, so if China has invested a lot of money in a particular African country and they already have a support base at Djibouti, and then is there is there a is there a study which shows that in such situations, China is more likely to send more United Nations peacekeepers, okay, under serving under the blue helmet, but trying to tackle that situation from different angles is, is was what I was asking you about. And especially in the case of Africa, because we have seen massive Chinese presence, uh, especially around the Gulf of Aden and, uh, you know, Horn of Africa. And even though anti-piracy is already eradicated, but, you know, the plan is still there. So the question is then asked as to why the plan is still there. And obviously it is now for protecting their economic interest. It is no longer to do with anti-piracy in that region. Now it has moved west. Piracy has moved west. So that was my question. Thank you. Uh, before I go to Afzalur Rahman to make his intervention, uh, let me very quickly ask my own questions. Uh, you know, use the uh, advantage of being a of uh, I have a, a, one quick question to each uh, Siami and uh, to Shreya. Uh, Siami, you mentioned about, I was very in, intrigued about your presentation saying that there is going to be greater restraint on China uh, uh, during and post COVID-19. Uh, where did you look India in that reinforcement of restraint on China? Because after a lot of reluctance, uh, you know, India finally accepted that Australian Navy will participate in Malabar uh, naval exercises, which are going on since 92 with the United States. In 2007, Japan was joining. 
so is india going to be you know also increasingly part of that reinforcement of a strength on china post covid 19 that's my question to siami and uh, dr pandey i think you also made a very interesting uh, presentation today but uh, i wanted to ask you uh, how covid 19 the way it has impacted and i was particularly you know happy to see you made distinction among various countries where some countries have fared much better in europe compared to some other countries uh, my question is how is that covid 19 impacting that already vociferous trends of brexit we were hearing even poland denmark italy you know names that are potential candidates to leave european union uh, what it is doing to that narrative of more and more countries beginning to talk about leaving european union what covid 19 is doing to that trend now so that's my question to the dr shraf pandey and uh, siami you may like to go first sir okay thank you sir for your question uh, as far as uh, india is concerned uh, as we know that its involvement with uh, vietnam in exploring oil and natural gas in uh, the south china sea india has a special interest Uh, uh, apart from freedom of navigation and considering its energy rich sea so in view of that india will likely to play an active role in the south china sea but it is a fact that india is also remains uh, under the shield of the united states and the united states is uh, taking proactive role in the recent years in the public post covid period and in in this situation india will continue continue to uh, lend its vociferous voice and had, uh, as we know that india is also taking steps like restraining and banning india chinese uh, applications and above that uh, we know the doklam crisis and several uh, forms of uh conflicting situations between the two countries so uh taking in view of the significance of the sea and being in a competition with the china with china in asia india will continue to push china to uh, abide by the uh, universal law and to be to settle the dispute in a peaceful manner thank you sir yes sir so thank you sir thank you for your question uh, sir as, as far as brexit is concerned we've seen that since the inception it has been a mess because the vote was just 51% versus 49% so um, and not and the leaders were themselves not very convinced as to they should go ahead with it so and this has been dragged as we see david cameron resigned theresa may could not make an impression at all she tried her best to stay on as prime minister couldn't do that boris johnson resigned as foreign secretary then became the prime minister it's a whole lot of uh, churning that is happening in britain and um, we were uh, i will uh, Um, just take a little while to say that in, even india was very apprehensive as to how will we define our relationship with the european union and britain but now what we see and it's not uh, us scholars who are actually theorizing and trying to come up with uh, uh, the perceptions that should prevail it is the businessmen who have actually chosen to make uh, to to make uh, an investment uh, which is as much as 300% more uh, in britain so they are seeing a lot of potential despite brexit happening or not happening and as far as the european union and Brex, uh, Bre brexit is concerned so they have a very conducive uh, they have a very uh, positive attitude towards the uk as i could see in the case of the pandemic as well because uh, so the earlier um, uh, medicines that were available they made sure that these were uh, th these reached not only the eu member states but also britain so they were but definitely taking britain under the umbrella trying to see that uh, the situation is alleviated and um, as you uh, mentioned poland hungary and other places uh, there um, the rise of the uh, right sir uh, has obviously created a lot of uh, 
consternation uh, if i may say uh, in the european parliament elections also the results uh, show that uh, yes they have a, a pretty much uh, uh, solid uh, backup and majority so, uh, so these are definitely uh, pulls and pressures which happen within the government but i think they are fairly managed well because each and every eu member state is very cognizant of the fact that they have a responsibility towards their citizens and they are also gaining a lot from uh, the membership of the european union the amount that i mentioned 1.8 trillion euros is huge and besides all the all the things that they are uh, getting i mean the ppes and uh, the collaboration which is happening the supply of medical um, equipment and the personnel uh, so i think it is a win win for them to stay united uh, during the pandemic thank you, and i think they are convinced of thank that thank you Shreya. also thank you uh, afzalur rahman for patiently waiting with us uh, please unmute yourself now introduce yourself and ask your question we have just about four minutes of this session left with me now, so we'll have to be a little quick. Uh, Afzalur, please unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Okay, thank you very much for giving me the floor. Uh, myself, Afzalur Rahman, a lecturer, uh, Department of International Relations, University of Chittagong, Bangladesh. So I have uh, several questions. First question is to uh, uh, assistant professor Siami. Before that, I I, I say very, uh, my thanks to the every uh, presenter. Uh, they really did wonderful job in this morning. So my first question uh, is to assistant professor Siami. Uh, do you think that ASEAN can be a best possible catalyst for solving the I mean South China Sea as uh, as, as there is in a competitions between USA and European country and many more things as ASEAN countries, uh, I mean, majority of the ASEAN member states have problems with South China Sea in terms of their claiming jurisdictions. So uh, this is the first question that do you think ASEAN can be a catalyst, best possible catalyst for solving this problem? So move on to my next questions to the uh, Dr. Swasti Rao. So, uh, as uh, my question is, what are the criteria of characterizing the surveillance state? Uh, I mean, in this time of a uh, pandemic period, as every state are surveillancing, uh, survey, uh, I mean, putting more surveillance to their own people, including my country and every country, according to the uh, reports, think in fact, United States of America also. So what are the criteria of, uh, I mean, very specifically, uh, I, mean, uh, uh, I mean, choosing these two countries, China and Russia, uh, first of all, and second question is, uh, as we see that uh, this pandemic is controlled by authoritarian government more than democratic government well. So, uh, as per as the statistics shown, China already controlled this pandemic well rather than one of the biggest country, a democratic country of the planet is India, okay? So in fact, USA too, in fact, some of the European countries. <coughs> so in this ground, how you tell that, uh, what's the rationality of uh, your paper uh, to characterizing this surveillance as a negative connotations, as I am understanding so. And my final question uh, is to Dr. Swati also is that in your uh, conclusion, you told that we need an uh, idealism based world order in coming decade. So, uh, so as you mentioned, these two countries are surveillancing more and hampering the security of the individual. So what will be your uh, formula of idealism based state in coming decades? What are these Two countries also contribute more, or other countries also join with them. Okay, this is my query. And uh, okay, uh, th that's all. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Swasti. I can request Swasti to be telegraphic. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you so much for the questions, uh, uh, you know, uh, Raman Saab, because um, uh, I think uh, the, the presentation had a few glitches, and I was waiting for the question answer session to clarify. Uh, see, the first thing is that when you say the, the criteria, okay, now like you guys rightly said, the surveillance is everywhere. It is not going to go, right? So if you have the technology, we are going to be using the technology. And right at the outset of my presentation, if you remember, I said that the surveillance is pretty much there, but uh, the, the, uh, the unfolding of that surveillance happens more in terms of a capitalist surveillance in, in, in countries like USA, while in the communist countries or dictatorial countries, it happens along with that 
surveillance capitalism we see a new form of uh, you know surveillance emerging which is about uh, you know sur survey uh, surveillance on the individual and their uh, social sphere okay so that was one thing i'm not saying that surveillance is going away somewhere or we are not going to make use of it or only certain countries are going to make use of it the second quick question is that what is the criteria uh, well definitely we have to set limits to it because for example china is like sir also said that a uh, financial credit system has been there in the us but nobody thought of a social credit system right it is only china who thought of the social credit system and they like to propagate it by saying that it is a trust building society but then if you were to look deeper into it you know you can understand that you are trying to get into the minds of the people and actually controlling every single thing making them be behave in the desirable way that the communist party wants them to behave okay so the criteria is that you know where do you put an end to it okay so you have to come up with some sort of a shared norm you know and that shared norm about it cannot cannot arrive unless you know there is a there is some sort of a value based uh, you know humanitarian world order which kind of takes these things head on and tells us that there is something deeply wrong with the way state is entering the private sphere though a part of it is uh, you know unavoidable why look at the covid situation had it not been for the surveillance technologies we would have had a better uh, we would have had a much more disastrous uh, you know uh, situation of the covid pandemic taken point taken but at the same time if you flip that coin and look at the other side of the entire thing this means that you know the the, the you know people of the of the world and you know especially as popular countries as popular as china okay which is the second uh, biggest power and the second biggest economy all right are subject to this kind of a mass surveillance brainwashing which is very problematic so where to keep that where to put those limits is definitely something that we all have to come to you know come to think of it and ultimately the conclusion i agree it was a little hurried and what i meant to say was that uh, when we say putting limits to that kind of a political obligation you know that entire discourse of political obligation of a citizen being a citizen i have i have the obligation to abide by you know the state laws that is the concept of political obligation Thank but also there should be limits okay and we have to come <laughs> sorry as you that. said there has to be limits as yes. you said i stopped you on that <laughs> no thank you i know you are wish one minute thank you swasti uh, siami you have one minute to answer yes sir, yes, sir. Uh, uh, I will answer to the question, and ASEAN undeniably play a very significant role in the regional uh, security and stability, and uh, have uh, enumerated some laws which is binding to all the parties of the South China Sea. And ASEAN, if it was free from China's interference and its dependence on uh, China were reduced, uh, where reduce it will play a proactive role uh, which will be beneficial for the conflict resolution in the south china sea that's my brief answer sir and thank you very much thank you uh, i have no time to make any concluding remarks and i think we don't require any concluding remarks i'm thankful to all the participants especially to dr rahman who joined us from bangladesh and to louis varantes who joined us from costa rica and each one of you but my special thanks to our four speakers who made excellent presentations and with that i hand it back to rostam because i think we absolutely have no time to say anything beyond this rostam thank you sir and so let's move to the vote of thanks as we don't have much time so yeah distinguished chair speakers ladies and gentlemen as we come to the end of the session i deem it a great honor to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of nice and wpc to all who have graced us with your presence and contributed their parts to make this event a resounding success and first of all we would like to express our profuse gratitude and sincere thanks to professor swaran singh for agreeing to chair and moderate the session today and our sincere thanks also goes to all our speakers for being a part of the event and delivering such a comprehensive and convincing presentation we are really honored to have all the speakers with us here today we would like to acknowledge our gratitude to our friends for uh, from the diplomatic community experts academia and media and different organizations finally i must mention our deep sense of appreciation for our audience who participated in the webinar and those who are watching us live on our youtube channel thank you for your valuable time and attention and for making the session productive with your questions
and we are truly honored to have you all with us this morning and hope to stay connected with you in future as well also do join us at our next session thank you so much